back to Free Speech Matters, the Free Speech Union of South Africa's podcast series, which delves into what free speech is, why it's important, how it is threatened, how it can be advanced, and much, much more. So today we're going to talk about hate speech, and specifically the Prevention and Combating of Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Act 2023, or more commonly known as the Hate Speech Act. It was signed into law by President Ramaphosa a few weeks ago. As part of the ANC's pre-election gift-giving surge that only a, an incumbent party can do. Now, ostensibly, tackling hate speech sounds like a noble idea. I mean, we should do what we can to diminish hatred on any grounds. But if this is not an unalloyed good, free speech demands, for the benefit of debate, the right to say often insulting and or hateful things. But to be the focus of the law on speech should be limited and rare. However, and this is what we're talking about, criminalizing hate speech may be a step too far. And in reality, it may be unlikely to do anything but shut down freedom of expression. To discuss the criminalization of hate speech, what the Act proposes and the problems society will, will face with it, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Daniela Ellebeck, the Constitutional Program Manager at the FW Disconnect Foundation. Daniela, lovely to see you again. First on this podcast, question, what does the Hate Speech Act provide? Right. So, so perhaps we can start with what the Constitution says, and then we mm -hmm. can go delve into the Act. Because as we know, we live in a democracy where the Constitution is the supreme law of our land. And yeah. every law or action that happens in South Africa needs to align with it. And if it doesn't, then it is unconstitutional or illegal. So what the Constitution says in Section 16.2 of the Bill of Rights is that everyone in South Africa has a right to freedom of expression. And then it goes on to specifically say a few things that this right expressly includes. So because we came out of an apartheid st state where the media was heavily censored and even jailed, we specifically in South Africa have freedom of the press and media. We've got freedom of artistic creativity and academic freedom. And specifically, and I want listeners to focus on this for this mm -hmm. podcast, every one of us has the freedom to receive and impart information and ideas. Now, those are all protected expressions. So those are expressions that the constitution sees as being protected by our right to freedom of expression. But section 16 has an internal limitation clause. So it says, okay, these are all expressions that we see as being protected and specifically included in these expressions or these four um, expressly stated things, but things that do not fall within this right and which are expressly excluded from being seen as falling under the protection of the constitution are propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, and then the clause that will, I think, be subject of much of our discussion today, the section 16.2c section that reads, the advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender or religion, and that constitutes the incitement to cause harm. So what is generally known as the hate speech clause. So that places us fair, fair um, firmly within what the Constitution sees as freedom of expression and what is not freedom of expression. Yeah. So if I go around on the street or on, for example, social media, which is the new public square, propagating for war, that is not protected expression. Mm -hmm. And if I go around um, on the public square or in the public street um, inciting people to imminent violence, that is also not protected expression. And then if I advocate for hatred based on those grounds, uh, that constitutes incitement to cause harm. So I'm stirring up hatred in people against a people based on these four grounds. Um, so their ethnicity, their religion, and so forth. And I'm saying then go do something about it, go harm them. That is not protected expression in terms of what the constitution says. So 
If something is unprotected expression, the state can regulate it the way it deems fit, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem that we are going to focus on today is why the Hate Speech Act actually goes further than what those unprotected forms of expression, propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, and the advocacy of hatred on those four grounds that constitutes incitement to cause harm does. So it mm -hmm. actually ventures into the ground of those protected expressions that we saw. It actually mm -hmm. takes away from our right to freedom of expression and it limits it. Mm -hmm. And it does so in a way that is unconstitutional. Now, you rightly asked what does this act do? So on the 6th of May, President Ramaphosa assented to the Hate Speech Act, which made it law. And I do want to point out for listeners that it is not yet in operation because he still needs to um, promulgate a date for when it will come into effect. But what this act does is that it criminalizes any expression that this act sees as being hate speech. So, it, and this is where the purple hits the fan, is that this act defines hate speech very widely. And if you are convicted of hate speech in terms of this act, then you will face up to five years in jail and or a fine. So if you contravene this act's very wide definition of hate speech and the state prosecutes you for it and you're found guilty, that could be your criminal sentence. And mm -hmm. then obviously we all know that on top of going to jail and or paying a fine, you also get a criminal record which affects the rest of your life in terms of job prospects and in terms of visa applications. So that has a very real effect for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Now, remember that we said that the state is free to regulate those unprotected expressions as it sees fit. Mm -hmm. Well, up till now, quote unquote, hate speech, as it's colloquially known, has been criminally prosecuted using existing laws, such as, for example, mm -hmm. Um, criminal area that saw people um, like uh, Vicky uh, Penny Sparrow and Vicky yeah. Momberg mm -hmm. both being found guilty. So in the case of Sparrow, um, she was found guilty for racist statements and she was fined uh, 5,000 rand and sentenced to two years imprisonment, which was suspended for five years. Um, and in addition, she was found to have committed hate speech under the Equality Act which is something we'll get to now. So in addition to being found criminally liable, she was found civilly liable. And so in addition to the 5,000 rand fine and the two years suspended prison sentence, she was ordered to pay civil damages of 150,000 rand, okay? In Mombik's case, she was sentenced to three years imprisonment, one year of which was suspended. So we already see people being found guilty criminally for hate speech based on the grounds of race in terms of criminal urea. Can, can I just ask you, sorry, Janelia, can I just ask you, why is the act necessary if criminal urea is available to, to someone who feels they have been criminally um, injured by a statement or comments or whatever may have been made, um, why, why hate speech act that specific, that criminalizes in addition, what, what does it offer that something like criminal injuria doesn't? Well, I mean, that was part of the arguments, right, uh, against this law, is that it's actually unnecessary. And that because of its very wide definitions, it goes, it's going to capture more expressions in its net than what the existing criminal law does or what the Constitution allows it to actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that was many organizations and free speech advocates submissions to Parliament when this act was still proposed law, so a bill in front of Parliament. This was most people's argument is that we don't need this law because if we want to send racists to jail, which is what the argument for this law was, we can already do that. We don't mm -hmm. need this law. And this law is unconstitutional for the reasons we'll get to. And I, and I mean, it's an absolute shocker once we get to that, what this law does. Okay. But yes, um, and then another argument was that we needed to uphold our obligations, um, you know, in terms of the declaration that was adopted by the United Nations at a conference um, on racism, racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and um, 
related tolerance that was held in uh, Durban, as well as in terms of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which uh, South Africa is a signatory to. But we've been a signatory to those uh, that um, that convention for many, many, many years. Yeah. Um, and our criminal law and our civil law provides adequately for that. So to say that we need it um, to abide by that convention, which I'll just call um, I said for the rest of the interview, is also faulty. Okay. So now we've got this new law. It's yet to come into operation, thank God. Um, but in terms of it, if I fall within its very wide net of what it sees as hate speech, I can go to jail mm -hmm. for up to five years and I can pay a fine, you know, and it's not or, it's jail and a fine. And on top of that, I want people to remember what happened to Sparrow, where you have criminal action and you've got civil action at the same time. Right. So that brings us to the to civil hate speech, which has been regulated since 2000 under the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act, right? Um, so hate speech in terms of the constitution, or at least in terms of hate speech defined as the constitution sees it, it's unregulated, it's unprotected, the um, state right. can regulate it. So we've got criminally, it's been regulated using criminal urea, and now civilly, it's been regulated since 2000 using the Equality Act. Okay. Now, on top of that, there are other laws that have also been available for the state to look at and use. So, for example, one can look at um, the incitement of imminent violence, for example, which can be um, regulated under uh, criminal area, the Riotous Assembly Act and the Intimidation Act. And then, of course, we've got um, the civil law. Now, why is this act problematic? So, in terms of this act, hate speech is defined as, in simple terms, consisting of three elements okay and, yeah. and this expression consists of the following elements it's harmful and it promotes mm -hmm. and propagates hate against a listed group of people in the act now i mean at first glance this criminal acts definition is a copy paste from um the equality acts definition of hate speech so we've got a criminal hate speech definition that mirrors the civil hate speech definition um, which is already really problematic because, I mean, for criminal hate speech, one can argue that you actually need a narrow definition if you already have mm -hmm. the civil law remedy. You don't want, you, don't, the, you know, the threshold you need to meet in order to be, send someone to jail needs to be higher and less expressions need to be caught in it than to order them to apologize, which is one of the remedies you can do for civil hate speech. However, I do want to point out to viewers here that because of the acts, um, a definition of these elements um its definition of criminal hate speech is actually <coughs> excuse me both wider mm -hmm. and vaguer mm -hmm. than the equality acts definition of civil hate speech which results in a definition of criminal hate speech that in the foundation's view is unconstitutional mm -hmm. The question I will, would ask, um, um, Daniela, can I ask this, is the, there are a number, there are a couple of, perhaps there are a couple of issues, but one of them is the onus of proving hate speech in civil context is on the balance of probabilities. In other words, if sort of 51, 51%, 49%, you, a judge is satisfied that hate speech occurred, they'll, uh, the, the person will have been judged to have contravened the, the, the act. With regard to criminal um, hate speech, they'd have to prove it as you would any criminal matter on, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, doesn't that risk, isn't there a risk there that you, you're going to have the state tied up in criminal hate speech action, hate speech actions that it actually would have to have a considerable amount of evidence to show 
that it meets that test of being beyond a reasonable doubt? No, that is a valid question. And I actually want to point out that in the foundation's view for a number of reasons. One being the way the fact the way um, the act defines hate mm -hmm. speech because um, its elements for harm, hate, and uh, um, are wider and vaguer than the civil laws, and because of the fact that it does not require the state to prove causation. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It actually is wider than mm -hmm. the civil definition of hate speech, um, and so. Beyond a reasonable doubt then becomes beyond a reasonable doubt of probably causing harm out there. And this brings me to the first problem with the definitions of, of the acts um, element of harm, which is, you know, when the civil definition or the definition of civil hate speech in the Equality Act was challenged in front of the Constitutional Court uh, in the matter of Quilani. The court said, okay, this definition is far too wide and it's unconstitutional and we're going to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. And that's how we ended up with um, a definition that reads the way the Hate Speech Act definition reads. But when it came to defining the elements, the court said harmful can be understood as deep emotional and psychological harm. That mm -hmm. severely undermines the dignity of the targeted group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because again, hate speech it's group based. It's not against okay. an individual. Okay. Now, in terms of the act, harm means substantial, which is considerable and deep, which is concerning because again, we're dealing with criminal hate speech as opposed to civil hate speech, right. emotional, psychological, physical, social, which we'll get to an economic detriment. So harm that objectively and severely undermines the dignity of the targeted individual or group. So we can see it's wider on mm. in numerous ways. One, um, the degree of harm required is decreased from deep to substantial. Um, and the forms of harm are increased from emotional and psychological to include physical, social, or economic. Now, mm. I mean, no one has an argument against physical, like that's no one's concern yet. But again, substantial emotional harm. I mean, so I say something that causes Saragon substantial emotional harm. So something that substantially hurts your feelings. Boom. I'm smack bam in the first element of this act's definition of hate speech, mm -hmm. because again, I can say it against an individual. Okay. Now, perhaps the most concerning element for me um, is that of social harm, which the act defines anything that undermines the social cohesion amongst the people in South Africa. That is very vague for a criminal law. That is yes. fine for civil hate speech under the Equality Act, because, again, you can be ordered to apologize, pay a fine, whatever. You're not going to end up with a criminal record. Yeah. You're not going to face jail time. Okay. And again, civil actions are between um, people. They're horizontal. They're not between the state and its citizens. Right. So you're not facing the state and all its power coming down on you. We were living in an era where, particularly with the conflict in the Middle East, um, one has, you know, has people have to put up with yeah. extraordinary levels of of hate speech spewed out at you or at, at groups that do hurt. I mean, they're, they're fundamentally, emotionally very distressing. But, you know, that not that life? I mean, isn't emotionally distressing, unless it sends you into, I don't know, nervous breakdown, but even then, I mean, it, 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 you, you certainly have, you, you can't, I don't see how you prove it as a group, other than a group is likely to agree that it's angered and offended. But, you know, we, we probably do that so often we, in a day, you know, <laughs> to, try, to try and prosecute so would be a right. Is that, I mean, for civil hate speech, um, the Constitutional Court in Kurilani said that even for civil hate speech, it has to travel beyond being merely offensive and it must be 
um, understood as extreme detestation vilification, um, which risks provoking discriminatory activities against that group. So again, even just with civil hate speech, it needs to go beyond being mere offensive sorrow. Mm. So here we have, and we'll, we'll, we'll show that as we go on in the discussion, here we have a law that parliament has said, yes, this is a good idea, despite um, people lodging thousands of um, submissions to parliament saying, please make it constitutional because of these problems. And one of the problem was the wide definition of hate, uh, wide definition of harm rather, mm -hmm. that includes, you know, just that you have to substantially hurt someone's feelings. Right. That includes um, saying something that um, causes, or rather not even causes, because you don't need to prove cause, but probably caused, um, you know, substantive undermining of the social cohesion in the country. Now, I mean, what political speech would fall in here? One can make many arguments for many po politician speeches, you know, um, <laughs> causing emotional harm or undermining the social cohesion in the you country, do, right? You do it every day. Exactly. And then, I mean, the most interesting um, inclusion here for me was economic harm, because, I mean, surely if I'm saying something that costs your business money, you want to sue me to get the money back. Mm. You don't want me to go to jail. That's not the right solution. In fact, what what it perhaps raises just from a practical point of view, the comparison between the civil and the criminal action is that the state would be responsible for prosecuting the case. Our money would be used for that purpose. The person being prosecuted would have to either probably sell their house to afford legal representation or be covered by free state representation, which is generally accepted not to be, you know, in, in the same quality, at the same quality level. Whereas in, at least in a civil case, both parties would, would have to pay the costs of taking the action, which in itself may be a limitation on whether civil action is actually instituted. That's correct. So, Sora, and I mean, we would think that this is now, you know, we've looked at this definition of harm. This is as bad as it gets, right? I mean, we've got substantially hurt feelings thrown in there. We've got this vague concept of someone thinking I've undermined the social cohesion amongst the people. And I mean, that, that could include offensive speech right there, you know, right? Offensive speech, smack bam, meets undermining the social cohesion. Right. But it gets worse than that. So I find it very ironic and deeply concerning as an individual that the Hate Speech Act that criminalizes hate speech fails to define what hate is. Mm. Now, this is very concerning because it basically means that the second element is undefined. The most crucial mm. element that one would say is the crux of hate speech is undefined. And this happened in spite of the fact that people asked for it to be defined. Mm. Now, what this practically means is that parliament decided to leave defining this crucial element to the courts that are going to hear these cases. Mm. And because it's the most essential element of the crime of hate speech, one can really say the parliament acted irrationally because it abdicated its legislative responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. And so it means that we as the public won't know for sure whether or not we're breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this means that this law goes against the constitution's founding value of the rule of law, which requires mm -hmm. that the law be clear, especially when it comes to a crime. I mean, mm -hmm. here I am, facing a five-year jail sentence and or a fine um, and a criminal record that's going to follow me lifelong. Mm. And I don't know if what I'm saying is hateful or not because the act fails to tell me what that is. Well, doesn't that have the effect then that if you don't know what hate is in term, from a legislative point of view, you either may stumble into a court case that find that will commit you to jail or you just 
stop ex you, you stop or limit it, or limit exercising your freedom of speech but that's exactly it and i mean that's what most people will do because the reality of facing five years in a south african jail and the criminal exactly. record that follows yeah will mean that most people will just shut up they won't mm. talk they'll rather mm. not say um the thing that someone might possibly find offensive and hurts yeah. their feelings and sends them uh, to jail or that possibly undermines social cohesion right? and sends them to jail. And I want to point out here that um, the Concord in Kwilani specifically endorsed three Canadian cases that define hate. And Parliament expressly chose not to define hate. So we've got a civil hate speech that defines what hate is, where the Concord has said, we like these three definitions, we've endorsed it. And I mean, taken together, um, amalgamated in some way, they can read as follows, you know, hate is strong and deep emotion of enmity, ill will, detestation, malevolence, and vilification against members of an identifiable group. So again, group, not individuals. That implies that members of that group are to be despised, scorned, denied respect and subjected to ill treatment because they're part of that group. So simply based on group identity, I vilify you, I detest you, and I imply that you need to be despised, scorned, denied respect and subjected to ill treatment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, think of Nazi propagation, uh, propaganda against Jewish people mm. in World War II. That Probably. falls squarely within this definition. That is a good example of hate speech. Now, in spite of the Concord say, for civil hate speech, we like this. This is mm. good. Okay? Parliament chose not to define hate. Mm. Mm. Now, if they had to find hate according to this case law, we can already see that, well, okay, we would have a much better law because then substantial emotional um, harm or substantial social harm, so substantially social, undermining the social cohesion of the people in the country, mm. um, would need to also uh, imply that members of these groups mm. need to be despised, scorned, uh, deni denied respect, and subjected to ill treatment. We already have a much narrower definition and reach. You exactly. know? Not, 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 but, not, not, not in the book, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this unexpected sunbeam that's lighting me up. It's illuminating you. It's illuminating. Um, Maybe the discussion too. No, so can you imagine the narrative then, you know, if we were to say that, oh, um, the EFF is against the hate speech law, like it sounds horrible. But if you were to talk about the censorship law, which this is, um, then it's a much better narrative for a political party. But yes, so I have to say, I think the chances of the third of the MPs, which I believe is around 133 MPs um, being found in an election here, in the month of uh, the national election, <laughs> being found, yes, directly challenges to the Concord is slim. Mm. But I mean, that brings us to what happens then with this, is that it can still be challenged by us as citizens, but we need to likely start down in the lower courts. I mean, we mm. can apply for direct access to the Concord, but there's lots of case law coming out of the Concord saying, mm, you know, we should be the court of final instance because we actually need these issues to be properly ventilated in the lower courts, which yeah. again means lots of money out of our own pocket, yeah. not taxpayer money, which is what Parliament would have been able to use. Right. So we have this hate speech law that says, mm, you know, contrary to the civil law, uh, we are not going to limit this to just public communication. So we've already widened the net there. It captures mm -hmm. private communication as well. Um, we are, are like the law, not going to require causation, even though the penalties are significantly different in a criminal system than in a civil system. And the balance of powers is significantly different in a criminal system than to a civil system. So we're not going to require causation. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have this very wide definition of harm that uh, incorporates vague concepts like undermining the social cohesion, and we are not defining hate. So that is why I say it can actually be argued that even though the balance uh, or the onus of proof 
you know, is different in a criminal case than to a civil case. So in a civil case, balance of probabilities, that what Daniela said um, to Sara, uh, based on Sara's group identity, um, was hate speech, uh, is yeah. actually, you know, like the, the threshold for that, for criminal hate speech is lower than uh, civil hate speech, even though the state would need to prove it beyond reasonable doubt because all of a sudden this can be on an individual basis. It doesn't need to just be on group identity. Um, oh, and by the way, in, in terms of the act, a victim includes a juristic person. So it's not based on, oh. uh, on a natural person. It doesn't need to be, it can be a business, by the way. Explain that okay. to me. Explain yeah. no, to no, me I how mean... I can... <laughs> oh, that that right. has all sorts of political implications. Um, but it, exactly. it, how, how, does it, how does a business, how can a business be subject of hate emotion. speech? Well, I know yeah. hate speech is to prevent things like what happened in the Holocaust. But so, my question, we've looked at the options, um, civil action, civil defamation, criminal injuria. What about, the, I mean, surely there are, there's plenty of existing common law criminal law that that could be that could be used it could be um, incitement it could be assault it could be a re it, um it, uh, what you call a, a, a damage to property there the, the are options that are very not in every case but in certain cases would provide the the criminal basis yeah, violence. Violence. if you were going to if you were going yes, to yeah. incite harm against for example who is for yeah. stocking certain products um you know like based coming from a country based on the ethnicity of the people in that country or, or whatever i'm just thinking about the middle east conflict mm -hmm. that would be uh public violence all of that oh, of course mm -hmm. there's existing common law to deal with this and there's no reason why a victim needs to include a juristic person and also mm -hmm. i mean the whole idea of hate speech is that it's based on people as a group that you are doing Doing something that vilifies members of that group and says they need to be subjected to ill treatment because they're part of that group. That is the whole idea of hate speech. How does that include a business? I have no idea. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Now, remember how in the beginning we discussed how we came out of the apartheid state where we did not have freedom of expression. So that's why it's specifically enshrined in our constitution. And we say that this now includes freedom of artistic creativity, um, academic freedom, freedom of the press, and the freedom to impart information and receive ideas, okay? The mm -hmm. Act no way makes provision for the freedom to impart um, and receive information and ideas. That's not protected anywhere in this Act, um, even though the Constitutional Court has repeatedly said uh, we do not, um, you know, hate speech does not include offensive speech, and courts have said uh, there's no right to not be offended in this country, because freedom of expression means that we're going to offend one another um but that does not mean that that's hate speech it does not mean that's unprotected speech because and i want to i want to ask viewers to think about it this way is it sounds all everything sounds wonderful and dainty to say oh people will never be able to say something that i find offensive offensive again great okay think about what that means for you you will never be able to say something that might offend someone. Mm. How many times in your life have you offended people? Um, mm. You know, not even on purpose, just because of how you said. Um, mm. Think of current society where really just in terms of woke culture and cancel culture, there's this thing of you should immediately lose all benefits of participating mm. in society because you said something that a few people found yeah. offensive. That is not free society. That means that... You know, that's leaning towards totalitarianism. Right. Now, in, I don't know if one should call this an attempt. I will call it an attempt for diplomacy's sake. To protect the specific grounds of freedom of expression listed in Section 61. So journalists, uh, creatives, and academics. And then also bear in mind that Section 15 of the Constitution expressly protects the right to freedom of religion, opinion, belief, thought, and conscience. So very wide, mm -hmm. um, locally just called freedom of religion. 
even yeah. though it protects everyone's right to believe or not believe, basically have an opinion, not have an opinion, have a thought, don't have a thought, you know, that's what it protects. Um, and obviously, you know, you don't need protection for something that you just keep to yourself internally, even though that's obviously part of what that right is. You need it for when you manifest that externally. So the constitutional has said, the constitutional court has said that, um, you know, freedom of religion includes protection for the external manifestations of that conscience, that thought, that belief, which obviously means speaking about it, um, saying it publicly, you know, mm. where it can cause offense. Mm. So the act does um, try and protect these, but because of the way um, these protections are drafted, they are self-defeating mm. because they rely on the act's wide and vague definition of harm, and they rely on the act's non-existent definition of hate. So basically, they would read along the lines of something as, um, you know, Sarah gone as a journalist uh, who reports on something in a way that uh, the, a reasonable South African um, who is aware of what is going on, so they're aware of the context, understands this potentially, because again, remember, the state doesn't need to prove that it actually caused any harm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need to prove it actually hurt someone's feelings. You don't need to prove it actually undermined uh, the social cohesion. It actually cost someone money. Mm -hmm. um, so Sorrow as a journalist reports on something in a way that a reasonable South African would understand as uh, potentially uh, inciting substantial uh, emotional harm, social harm, is not guilty of hate speech as long as she did it in good faith. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, unless what she said advocated hatred, mm -hmm. um, which we don't know what that means because the act fails to define hate, um, and it constituted the incitement to cause harm, which, again, mm -hmm. is very vague and wide. So... It therefore cancels itself out. It basically says Sarah isn't guilty of hate speech as a journalist unless what she says is hate speech in terms of this act. And again, that because of the wide definitions means oh, you have no protection, right? Um, yeah, and so it's going to stifle strong and offensive yeah. views. Um, my 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 concern, another concern, is the fact that just from a realistic, perhaps even political point of view, that the, the people taken to court or charged for committing hate speech are going, the, a lot of the acts will be taken, the, the charges will be laid by relatively powerful people or groups, and the accused will be disproportionately perhaps um, of one group of people, color-wise, or disproportionately um, individuals who really, you know, are possibly relatively easy to all your all the sort of limitations considered, but relatively easy to prosecute, but don't themselves actually have a huge impact on society. And I mean, I'm thinking of very much of the P Penny Sparrow case where whatever she said and did the amplification by social media was probably the issue rather than the fact that what she said was ob obnoxious, but, you know, it could rise anger, but it wasn't going to bring ter tear apart the fabric of society. In other words, it becomes a political football. And I, I, I add to this in saying that all the surveys we've done over a considerable number of years when we've questioned um Participants as to what issue is, is their is their biggest problem currently in their lives. Right down at the list, literally, literally, this last or second last item is racism, which is obviously the hatred that I imagine is 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 largely behind a lot of yeah. It's it politically it's 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 not. I mean. There are so many social, other social ills. Our politics I mean, is the most racial, yeah. racist space, I think, in my personal yeah. opinion. Yeah. Isn't that, that it's, unless one gets very 
creative about it and uh, it might be a bit like they did in Scotland with a hate speech bill where you know once it came what once became live what happened was that there were floods of applications to charge the then um, prime minister of Scotland for, for committing hate speech but that sort of tactic aside where you suddenly flood, you know, the, the court with the, with what no one had in mind for, for this event. Um, is, 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 isn't it have more sort of political posturing potential than actually dealing with a social ill? I personally do not think that criminalising people and sending them to jail will deal with the social ill of um, underlying tensions. Um, and that is why I support Peputa or their Quality Act, rather, uh, creative remedies that it gives to the court um, to allow that. Because actually what you want there is a way to put people in a situation where they realize that, wow, their prejudices that said, um, that caused them to say these horrible things about this specific group and wanted this group out of South African society, essentially, was wrong. It was prejudices. Mm -hmm. And this is not what individuals in that group are like. And that's what you want. And mm -hmm. we've only had the right to freedom of expression for 30 years now. And already we've given that power back to the state to mm -hmm. throw us in jail for saying offensive things, essentially, mm -hmm. because that's what this act does, is it criminalizes offensive expression because mm -hmm. of its wide definitions. Um, and it's failure to define things. I mean, it absolutely boggles my mind that we have a law in South Africa that criminalizes hate speech but doesn't tell anyone what hate is. That, like, that, that is just people who want to say things and engage with anything that could potentially be seen as falling in these grounds. And a lot of them are, you know, subject to public debate at the moment. Um, you know, people want to be able to engage in uh, public debate on the things like, for example, um, you know, migrants and refugee and asylum seekers. There's lots of comments going on about that and how do we deal with this as a country. They want to engage with each other on the ground of religion. They want to engage with each other on the ground of um, gender, gender identity, you know, uh, sexual orientation, all mm -hmm. of that. But now we've got this wide definition of harm, the non-definition of hate, Mm -hmm. uh, that could potentially see their offensive comments um, or, you know, their comments that are potentially offensive even lumped in here. Mm -hmm. And people are, like you said, they're going to self-censor. And, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not what one wants in a free society. One mm -hmm. wants in a democracy to be able to have these debates, find one another, find truth, and find the way forward together. We don't want to live in a nanny state where the state basically uses its gun on us and throws us in jail for whatever it decides it doesn't like, which is what we had under apartheid. And yet here we find ourselves again under the same laws. And some would argue perhaps even more draconian. Mm. Well, uh, uh, Daniela, I think we have to end there. I think just to say that, in fact, there's a lot worse in life than being offended. And South Africans are robust and the exercise of free speech has displayed as much. But thank you very much for, for coming on and for, for extrapolating where criminalization can actually go to, to, to our detriment and uh, you know, gear up for the gear up for the fight. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your right to say what you like may be circumscribed and, um, you know, that would be a tragedy as far as, far as I'm concerned. The, the, and it also is very likely to not affect those who probably deserve, who would probably deserve criminalisation the most. So... Thank you for being with us. Um, if you have a query or seek advice on hate speech and free speech in general, uh, please go to please drop us a line at info at freespeech.org.za or go to our website on freespeech 
www.freespeech.org.za. Um, my thanks to the Institute of Race Relations for supporting this podcast. And I'd like to acknowledge our association with the Free Speech Union of the United Kingdom. Thank you, and we'll be back to try and overcome any potential threats to our, to our free speech in the future.